this is a landmark year for college athletics, but for college football in particular, because we're going to get to a conclusion in Johnson versus the NCAA, which is going to change how we monetize college football, in particular in college sports overall, right? You think you don't like name, image, and likeness. Wait till you see what Supreme Court has to say about these things. Now, on top of that, we're also going into the last year for Oklahoma, Texas, and the Big 12. We know this, but also the last year for USC and UCLA in the Pac-12. We're also going to have a totally new network for where the SEC is seen. We're going to have a totally new network for where the Big 10 is also seen. And the college football playoff is going to have its last go at four teams when we go to 12 following year, we hope, right? We're still working out some of the kinks on that. But all points, point two, yeah, we're going to have expansion to playoff 2024, especially by 2025. But, you know, there's other things to work out, notably money, which is what college football is about. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you believe. The facts are the sport is about money. Moolah, De Niro. We got college football coaches making $10 million a year where 40 years ago, you could make $100,000 call that a good day. Okay? I remember being in Stillwater for local media day, 2019. Mike Gundy's holding court. He says, you know, it's criminal how much they pay us. Man makes $7.5 million a year. Okay? Get my point here. But this also underscores what the Big 12 is up against because you know that not only is the SEC and the Big Ten beating you like a drum, you also know that you aren't even in the same hemisphere as competing for a national championship with those teams. Again, going to outline that point a little bit further down in the show. But as we get into this, it's also important to note Oklahoma and Texas are going to pay north of $100 million to leave one year early, which, think about that for a second, even $100 million, that's still such a large amount of money to say, I want to graduate one year early. But you know what? If you got it, you got it. Because Texas certainly does. And Oklahoma ain't turning down nothing but its college. Like, those are two programs among, I think, just 12 or 15 that actually operate in the black when we're talking about football. But in as far as they are leaving in 2023, I'm going to go through what I think is, well, two cool segments. Their checklist. The first one, I'm giving to the Big 12. This is your 2023 checklist. You have to reestablish the brand that is the Big 12. That's full stop. You have to build your program around what makes it unique and elite, which is another way of saying put Patrick Mahomes everywhere. Everywhere. Embrace that the Big 12 held him to five and seven and still produced him. To the NFL and all its many fans who can give a damn about our sport until the NFL draft comes around. And they're like, hey, RJ, who's CJ Stroud? Casuals. But you should do it because the NFL is America. And as long as you can claim a two-time MVP, Super Bowl MVP, Super Bowl champ, you should do it. Okay? Also, not to underscore this any more than I have to, but I will. It was two Big 12 quarterbacks in this year's Super Bowl. And it was Oklahoma and Texas Tech. Or another way of saying, just like old times, Patrick Mahomes in a shootout with a Big 12 quarterback. By the way, Baker Mayfield beat him. Jalen Hurts did not. Okay. Throw that at you. Swallow that. Take that down with a little bit of nourishment. Okay? Because we're not done on that front. We're not done on that front. I get asked this question all the time. How does Patrick Mahomes go 5-7 and seven Texas Tech? Let me tell you about another dude that came out of White House, Texas, which is a real place. That's the suburb of Tyler, Texas. The same time that Patrick Mahomes came out of White House, Texas. What's Dylan Cantrell doing right now, guys? That's how you go five and seven in Texas Tech. All right? Also, shout out to It's Philly Blunts. It's Philly Blunts today. That Patrick Mahomes Sr. is a national treasure, but also let his kid go to Texas Tech. When it's very clear to the rest of us now that Yo, man, that dude should have been almost anywhere else, but Cliff Kingsbury got him. Cliff Kingsbury made him into a player that Andy Reid could go get. We can keep going down that line, and it could be fun. But that's a narrative. That's a story that the Big 12, the conference, should be telling, and they should be telling it until we tell it like we say Tom Brady is the GOAT. Do that, okay? The second thing that you should do to help reestablish the brand 
is crank the volume on these budding rivalries. You have some really cool things to put in front of us, like Baylor versus BYU. That is the Baptists versus the Mormons, which is the thing that we can say and nobody gets upset. Like, that's awesome. Because now you have not just two schools, but two different groups of people who have other reasons to not like each other. Other reasons to want to see their team beat the other team. You also casually got some outstanding quarterback play coming out of BYU. You've had some outstanding quarterback play and running backs lately coming out of Baylor. Also, you know, you got your border rivalries that now all of a sudden have some spark to them. Kansas State is the Big 12 champ. Kansas is not a doormat anymore. I mean, even as we're talking about this, we're talking about guys like Richard Reese, who came out of nowhere, a three-star from Central Texas, who ends up being your bell cow back in a year where everybody thought it was going to be Craig Smith, right? You have that. You should embrace those stories and push those guys to the forefront. You know what Richard Reese reminds me of? Another kid who ended up at Iowa State that nobody thought about. That was a three-star athlete. Ends up being a unanimous All-American. His name is Brees Hall. Do you know what I'm saying here? Like, you got players. And the fact of the matter is, people don't care. How do you make them care? By continuing to say it over and over again. Kansas has Jalen Daniel, an outstanding quarterback, a fun quarterback to watch. If you told me that Jalen Daniel is going to end up like Jalen Hurts, I would believe you because he has those sorts of tools. And you know how much I love me some Lance Leipold. Like, they're fun and they're good. And they can challenge a Kansas State team who wrecked an undefeated season for Texas Christian in the Big 12 championship. The Sunflower State's rivalry is one that you can lift up now. As a matter of fact, it was a watershed moment when we had, you know, people picking games and people pick Kansas State, Kansas over, say, you know, Oklahoma versus anybody. That's wild, but that's what you have. You can continue to build on that. I understand I'm also like glossing over the basketball parts of this, but I understand that the Big 12 is the basketball conference for obvious reasons, but these are all things you can do for football. How great your conference could be when the football is this good. We also can talk about Texas Christian versus everybody because I think everybody has a reason to want to fight Texas Christian. Okay, number one, you go five and seven, you run rough shot over the league, you lose the Big 12 championship, and then you embarrass us in the national championship game. I'm glossing over the Big 10 thing against Michigan, but you get me, right? You also, if you played Texas Christian close, you feel like you probably could have beaten Michigan, which ought to really make Michigan fans all the way upset. What I'm saying here is Texas Christian playing Texas Tech, playing, my goodness, Houston, playing Central Florida, that's going to be a lot of fun, right? I also think that they're proud about it now. Like Fort Worth is coming out here with the chest out. Plus, they've been owning Texas for like the last 10 years, so they feel some kind of way about that. But that also leads me into a larger point about your coaches, right? Thinking about Sonny Dykes. You need to tell these dudes stories, and you need to tell them over and over again. As a matter of fact, when I was talking about Chris Kleiman could be the guy to knock off Sonny Dykes and Texas Christian, one of the points that was raised in our production meeting that I raised the production meeting was, yeah, you're talking about a guy that's won national championships and producer Kat, who's in the number one chair today. Thank you to her. She was like, RJ, you need to say that because we know that, but I don't think they know that. Yo, Big 12, I'm giving you this. You have a national champion coach who just won your conference championship and people want to act like it's a fluke. It's not. That dude can coach. Lance Leipold, national champ. He can coach. Steve Sarkeesian, we know about. Offensive coordinator at Bama, Brent Venables, we know about who's leaving, but you get my point here, right? You have these guys that are not just winning national championships, but they're developing great prospects. I can point to Dave Aranda being an outstanding coordinator at LSU before flipping Baylor from two and seven to 11 and two. I can point to Matt Campbell, who I think is quietly one of the most underrated coaches in the sport, not just developing a unanimous All American in Brees Hall. And perhaps even a first round pick again in Xavier Hutchinson after catching like 103 balls last year and being a Bolitnikoff Award finalist. That dude developed a four year starter that anybody that watched Big 12 football wouldn't tell you could spin it. That dude developed a dude that went at Oregon's neck and beat him in the Fiesta Bowl and capped off the best season in Iowa State football history in a plague year. 
You get what I'm saying? That dude developed Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy didn't get beat until he was knocked out of the game because he could throw football in the NFL. But it was not necessarily like he was going to go run a rough shot inside the Big 12. What I'm saying here is somehow, some way, you have developed some outstanding individual players and you have some outstanding individual coaches. You need to tell everybody what those things are and who those people are, and you need to claim them. Because that's the big part of this. As we were talking about Jalen Hurts, right, going into the Super Bowl, one of the points of interest was who gets to claim him. And I can't believe this, but I had people going, well, the NFL says on his bio that he went to Oklahoma. And I'm going, y'all are asinine about that. And it also speaks to just how few people actually watch our sport as opposed to the NFL. But the fact of the matter is Oklahoma did such a great job of claiming Jalen Hurts, of saying, we didn't bench you in the national championship game when you weren't getting it done, even when you fumbled the football like you did in the Super Bowl. Okay? We stayed with you, which means something different now because we watched Lincoln Riley pull out Spencer Rattler for the dude that eventually wins the Heisman in 2022, but we didn't know that at the time. That's because Oklahoma claimed him. That's what you have to do if you're the Big 12. Lay hands on these dudes like it's Sunday at worship and make them yours. Believe it, receive it, maybe you get to a national championship. But that's also where we get to the Oklahoma and Texas part of this, right? Because on their checklist, I got it. It's pretty simple. Pretty, 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 pretty simple. This is a legacy year for the University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas. No matter what you have done beforehand, everybody's going to look at how you lead this conference. Because in January... The Big 12 gave both Oklahoma and Texas the middle finger. How did they do that? Take a look at the scheduling, okay? But to start with, when Oklahoma plays Oklahoma State, they have to win, which, frankly, has been what they have done for the better part of 120 years. They have beaten Oklahoma State like they are a drum. Beat them like they stole something. Beat them like a rented mule, okay? Beat them like a Hertz car that you don't plan on returning. What I'm saying here is, you can't afford to lose to Oklahoma State and Mike Gundy because he's already made this grudge match. He didn't even know why you should be invited to their meetings in 2022 after saying you wanted to leave. And knowing that Oklahoma State has been in it a couple of these games the last couple of years, I would not doubt it that Oklahoma State players are made to understand you got to go win this one because we need to send them out on an L. Doesn't matter what we did before it matters that you beat them in 2023. And for Oklahoma, the same is true. For Texas, I'm not going to say beat Oklahoma because, you know, 49-0 last year, but also you're going to the same conference. You're locked at the hip, which is still wild and strange to say. It's like seeing Superman and Lex Luthor go to the prom together. I just, I just don't get it. By the way, in this analogy, Oklahoma is the smartest man in the world. I'll let you figure that out which one of those people are. Now, I say for Texas, it ain't beating Oklahoma. It ain't being Texas Tech, ain't being Texas Christian or Baylor. It's not even don't lose to Kansas, which, you know, could happen. It's beat Houston. Okay. All right. For the uninitiated, you cannot, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to recreate this moment. When I looked at Texas' schedule and I double took, like had to double check, double look, Texas got to go to Houston? Oh, my God. Texas got to go to Houston. All right. Texas looks down on Houston. Not unlike, it's not even like Oklahoma looks down on Oklahoma State because they traditionally played each other. Texas looks down on Houston in such a way that they refuse to play Houston for 20 years. That is not an exaggeration. After leaving the Southwest Conference, or I should say the disillusion of their, thereof, Texas and Houston had one three-game series, 2000-2002. Since then, nothing, nada, zip, even though that's a natural rivalry, but not for Texas. Texas doesn't want to play Houston and never, ever, ever was going to travel to play Houston after having won the national championship in 2005. They didn't want to do it. want to do it, right? You'd have to match them up in a bowl game. That's how that would have to happen because Houston – is home base for Texas. It's kind of like the way Oklahoma feels about Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's home base. Why would we want to go and play in front of your fans who we look down on? 
another way of putting this, and this is local to me, but you'll get where I'm coming from in this. I go to the University of Tulsa, okay? It is a privilege for the University of Tulsa to play Oklahoma. They understand this. Oklahoma understands this. It is a privilege for the University of Tulsa to play Oklahoma State. They understand this. I remember being a cheerleader going to Fayetteville for the University of Tulsa to play Arkansas. And at the time, I was like, man, this game should happen every year. Like, they should have a home and home. And then I had to go look it up. Where University of Arkansas Athletic Director Frank Broyles had to say, yeah, we're never going to travel to Tulsa. Why? Because it's beneath us. We are not doing that. We'll do it at Oklahoma. We'll even do it at Oklahoma State. We're not going to do it at the University of Tulsa. That is the energy for which the University of Texas has looked down on Houston. And now you got Fertitta money, Dana Holgerson's mouth, and an air raid offense that wants to get it in. And it's only opportunity to beat the hell out of you. I'm telling you, man. Steve, Coach Sark, better come correct. Because you will never hear the end of this, not just from Houston fans, but from Oklahoma fans, from Texas A&M fans, from Arkansas fans, from anybody that's got any shouting distance at Houston about having lost to Houston. So you have to win that game. Casually on this list, of course, win 10 games, win double digit, right? That means you got to beat most of your Big 12 opponents, if not all. And frankly, I think it would be quite fun for Oklahoma and Texas to end up in the Big 12 title game in the year which will be their last in the Big 12 because it will also underscore for them what has been true since the inception of this league. Oklahoma has run it on the field and Texas has run it with its money. Okay? University of Oklahoma, unchallenged and unmatched when it comes to the legacy of who wins what in football in the Big 12 conference and who carries that flag. University of Texas had so much money that they browbeat the networks and or the Big 12 into having their own damn channel that nobody watched. Nobody, but nobody. And it might have ruined the Big 12 for the next 10 years, right? At the time that they did this deal. That's how much money whipping is going on in the University of Texas, but it also underscores something else that is important about the University of Texas. Nobody has done less with more, less, <laughs> more money, less getting out of it. Better recruiting, less getting out of it. We're talking about 2009 for the last time a team not named Texas Christian had played in the national championship game, and that is University of Texas, when they basically got beat like they stole something by the University of Alabama at a time when everybody's like, oh man, this Alabama thing could go on for a while, and it's still going on. That's what we remember about the University of Texas. Remember the University of Texas ain't had no first-round draft picks since like 2013, Okay. We remember the University of Texas said we're back after beating a Georgia team in a Rose Bowl, didn't want to be there in the Rose Bowl. We remember the University of Texas went five and seven and then had the nerve to crow at us when they go eight and five. I remember going eight and five at Oklahoma is a down year. Somebody got fired that year. Some, some, somebody going to lose their job if Oklahoma goes eight and five. Okay. Now, get into a little bit of this, but I also think this is an interesting spot for Brent Venables. Because Brent Venables is going to face a future in Oklahoma that nobody's ever seen before. I think it is important to underscore that the last time that we thought Oklahoma was really good, it's Alamo Bowl, 2021, when Caleb Williams stayed around to help Oklahoma beat Oregon. At the time, Oklahoma had 105 players on the roster. Okay. And in 2023, about two years later, just 22 of those players remain. Now, graduation, whatnot, but also attrition and transfer. In 2022, Brent Venables had to add 40 scholarship players. That's half your roster. Half of it. In 2023, it's a top five recruiting class, but he added 37 scholarship players. Continuity is a luxury. It used to be a certainty. And Brent Venables is learning to operate in an environment where he still wants his relationships and his continuity to be the pillars of his program, which means that he has to overhaul a culture in such a way that it comes to resemble some of the things that he's been associated with in the past, which Clemson is a great example of that. 
So was Oklahoma circa 2000, 2002, right? When he was there. And certainly his time at Kansas State, where he came as a Juco guy to play for this dude named Bill Snyder, who might be, you know, the greatest coach to ever turn around any program ever. But I think it's important to raise those things while he's also saying things like, I recruited Jackson Arnold and others by saying, you got to stick with me. If you stick with me, it's going to be hard. If you stick with me, it ain't going to be easy. If you stick with me, usually we're going to do it the right way and the right way is the hardest way possible. He's saying things like, it has to be me, or excuse me, it has to be we versus me. He's saying these things that sometimes can feel cliche. And maybe they are, but cliches come out of truth, right? We say them all the time because there is truth to them. You're going to have to believe in what Brent Venables is building, and you're going to have to believe it blindly if you are Oklahoma in 2023 because that man is going to have to set you up for success in a league that, frankly, I don't think Oklahoma is ready for. I I, I think the players will be. I think the support staff will be. I think Brent certainly is. Like, he turned down the Auburn job just because he didn't think it was the right fit for him. But Oklahoma fans are going to find out just how hard it is to be a fan in that league and how your expectations are no longer going to be 12-2. and two. They're going to be 8-4, and 7-5. Some years, they're going to be 6-6. Six and six. What Tennessee has gone through in the last 15 years, that could be you. What Ole Miss is, that could be you. What Texas A&M is, that could be you. But to walk in that thing and believe that you're going to be Alabama or Georgia is asinine and you ain't earned it. That's what environment Brent Venables is going to be operating in. So I'm here for it. I'm not going anywhere. But you should enjoy this last year of Big 12 football because it's going to be the last time that you get to look at the schedule and say, yeah, we're going to win 10 games. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.